gathered them together. As a hen protects her young beneath her wings. But Jerusalem wouldn't let you. Am I any different? Your own children killed your prophets. They stoned your messengers. Can I claim any innocence? Your word is my light. But how often do I choose the darkness instead? You are my salvation. But how often do I choose rebellion? Forgive me, Lord. You are my fortress. I seek to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Delighting in you, Lord. Meditating on your word, Lord. Be merciful and answer me, Lord. Do not turn your back. Do not reject me in anger. You are my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, Lord. Hold me close. Teach me how to live. Amen. Greetings in the name of the Lord on this third Sunday in Lent. As we continue to walk through the shadows during this season of Lent in 2022, we embrace the companionship of the Lord as he walks with us through, in particular today, the shadow of death. As a congregation, we have shared in the passing of Sue Kiefer as we even began this season of Lent. And now I share in the journey of grief as my family walks through the loss of my mother. Marie, who passed on to the kingdom triumphant early yesterday morning. We appreciate your prayers and support through the days and weeks ahead as we prepare to celebrate her life and bear witness to the power of the resurrection as her baptism is now complete. We shall share more details in the days ahead as we make preparations for a service of celebration and witness to the resurrection at her home church in Valencia, north of Pittsburgh, near the Mars area, uh, on April 2nd. Your kindness and patience is greatly appreciated as we engage in another element of transition for my family and the congregation in the months ahead. Please note the variety of announcements and opportunities to engage in the ministry and mission of the congregation in the upcoming weeks ahead that are listed in the bulletin and are posted on the website and distributed through What's Up at Unity each week's email. Two adjustments to our schedule for the week. Um, the booklets, Life is Messy, unfortunately the last few days have been a little messy, um, so they are not ready to go out. They will be distributed next week. Uh, unless things get messier and messier. Let's hope that's not the case. Uh, and as a result, the Thursday evening Life is Messy discussion will not be held till post-Easter time. So we will engage that book. We will engage its teaching, but just not till after Easter at this point. And the other announcement I need to make because of everything I'm dealing with uh, with my mother's transition from this life to the next uh, there will be no confirmation class today as originally scheduled. So uh, we'll make those adjustments, and we will meet next Sunday. You don't get out of it totally, Trevor and Sam, okay? You don't totally get out of it. We're just going to move it back a week. Now, let us enter into a time of prayer and preparation of our souls for worship this day as Bobby leads us in body, mind, emotion, and soul into worship through the gift of music this day.
In turning to the gospel account of Luke today, we join Jesus as he's traveling towards Jerusalem for the last time and the celebration of the Passover there and ultimately his final week of life. He has set his eye upon Jerusalem and what is before him. Now, Jesus has been growing in popularity with the people, especially as he has brought forth a new style of teaching with his illustrations, his parables, but even more importantly through his actions and dialogue with the people as he's implemented the truth about God's word. Embracing every element of human life while doing that, including the shadow of death. Listen attentively to the Lord's teaching. Even as people are telling him how bad things are in the world, are in the community, in the life of the Israelite people. As they live in a difficult time of strife, violence, and death. Now, there were some present with Jesus at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for the fruit on it, but he did not find any. So, He said to the man who took care of the vineyard, the gardener, for three years now I've seen, I've been coming to see this tree and look for the fruit on it and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the gardener replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. May God add understanding to the reading of his word. But more importantly, may it find application through our living lives of discipleship in this time according to the purpose of God. Please join me in the call to worship. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Thirsty our hearts crave living water. Hungry our souls ache to be satisfied. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. Weary, our minds are tired by thoughts that do not come from God. Thirsty, hungry, and weary, let us worship the God of love.
seated, but ask the children to come and gather around the baptismal font this morning. Just come here and you can sit down on the floor. Okay, just gather down, have a seat on the floor. Okay, now out here, because you're not going to see me if you're back there, and I'm going to have questions for you, and you can't see what I got in the baptismal font. So come out here, like sit here. Okay, guys, girls, good, that's good. Okay, so you can see me up here and what I have in the baptismal font. Okay, did all of you listen to the scripture focus story this morning, the parable that Jesus said? Hmm? What kind of fruit was supposed to be growing on the tree? Do you remember? What kind of fruit? Apples. Nope, not apples. Figs. 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 We are going to talk about apples, though. Okay? Uh, because I don't have any figs to show you. Okay? But we are going to talk about apples. Um, there's this apple. And there's this apple. And there's this apple. Okay, Brody, would you do me a favor and just take those apples around and show everybody in the, in the children's section here? Now, when you take a look at these apples, is there anything you notice about them? Hmm? Did you see them all? Mm -hmm. Do you think they all came from the same tree? There's three. There's three apples, right. There's three apples that came from... That's right, you have three people in your house, right? Awesome, yeah. You, your threes are wild in your house, I'm sure. Did they all come from the same tree, do you think? No. No? Why not? Different color of skin, right? Yeah, so they're not all from the same tree, okay? Uh, this actually is a Granny Smith apple. That's what that's called. This is a Gala apple. And this is a red delicious apple. Okay, they're all apples, but different skin, right? Okay. Um, do you know what the most important part of an apple is, though? Oh, you didn't get to see it? There you go. Okay, all right, you got to see them? Actually, you can do an examination here in a minute, okay? We'll let you do the examination I'm going to ask for. What's the most important part of an apple? Does anybody know? The what? Oh, the flesh of the, the apple. Okay, in order for more apple trees, it would be the seed be the most important part, right? So what's the most important part? Even though we enjoy the apple, what's the most important piece so we can continue to enjoy apples? More apple trees, more seeds, exactly. Okay, now... Could you tell me which one of those apples is brand new, just fresh off of the tree? Or which one of them is probably the oldest of them? Can you, can you take a hard look at them? You can touch them. You think that's the freshest off the tree? Okay. Which one do you think is the oldest off the tree? You can feel them. That one, why? It, yeah, it's crinkly. It's wrinkly, isn't it? Yeah, it means it's probably the oldest of the apples, right? It's not fresh and crisp like the Granny Smith apple. Okay, so if the most important part of the apple is the seed, I want to show you that, okay? I'm opening the apple, okay? Do you see the seeds in there? Everybody see the seeds? How big are they? Not very big, are they? No, they're not very big. But where are they at? Are they on the outside of the apple? Where? Uh, uh, they come from right, they come from trees, that's, right? That's, the water. that's what that's our water of baptism, okay, that nourishes all of us. I remember. You remember, yeah, because I think we did a baptism in one day a whole three. Yeah. Yep, well you got hugged that day a lot. Yep. Okay, so Where's the seed at in the apple? Is it on the outside? No. no. Where's it at? In the middle, in the core of the apple. Okay? Go ahead and have a seat because i got to ask you a couple more questions, okay? So where do you think the most important seed in your life is? Is it on the outside? Uh, I get 
Oh, Princess of Elsa. Yeah, I see the dress today. Yeah. All right, but where's the most important seed in your life? Inside your soul, right. At the core of your being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do we call that? Oh, okay. All right, but where, where, do we, where do we call that? Where's the seed? The seed in our soul. It's in our heart, we sometimes refer to it as, in the heart of our lives. Do oh. you remember? Good. Right, and the more we hug, the more love we can spread, right? Exactly. Okay, so here's your next test. Okay, here's your next test, and I'll need, uh, Sam, you can help me with this exercise, and Trevor, okay? Here's your next, okay, here's your next. Go ahead and have a seat so you can get one of these. Give everybody one of those, and Trevor, give everybody one of these, okay? And think about where these seeds are and what they're supposed to grow into, okay? Because this was the problem with the fig tree. How old was the fig tree? Does anybody know? Remember? How many how old was it? No, it wasn't really old. Nope. It was only how old? Up oh, out there, how many of you remember how old? Thank you. I see people holding up three fingers. Okay, we had three apples, three fingers. We have three little girls up here that are all the same. Yeah, three. It, you know, we, we believe in a Trinitarian God. You know, you think three might be important? Okay, today? Okay. Now Take a look at that tree. What's the problem with that tree if we're talking about apples? Hmm? hmm? What's? There's no apples on the tree, right? It's a. Oh. Okay. Yet, yeah, right. It would go healthy. It would grow healthy if it had good work on it, right? But. After three years, the fig tree is bare. It has no fruit. Ooh, problem, right? We're not getting any good fruit out of that tree yet, are we? And what's the owner want to do? Get rid of the tree. In three years, it hasn't produced anything. So what's the gardener say? The gardener says, uh, wait a minute. Uh, I don't think you understand fruit trees. Uh, it takes at least four years for a fruit tree to produce fruit that's any good. Okay, and with a fig tree, how many more years do we need to give it? One more year. One more. How old are you girls now? Uh, uh, twelve and a half. Four and a half. So how old will you be in a year? Uh, six. When it's on that almost day. six, right. You'll be almost six, when right. Anybody here three years old? Yeah. Nope, everybody's older than three, right? Oh, wait, he's three years old? Okay, all right. So... We need to give him another good year before he's going to grow all good fruit, Mom and Dad. Okay? All good fruit. Okay. You have a good memory. Do you know that? Yeah. Right. So what do we got to do? We got to nurture the tree. Okay? And where does a tree get its nourishment from? Water in the ground. It goes down and sucks up the water out of the ground, the soil. And the leaves, that's where the sun gets into the tree. And the seeds grow. And what will we produce if we're good trees? If we're good trees, what are you going to produce? Oh, come on, people. What are we going to produce? Good fruit. And, you know, somebody likes to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay. Yeah, you produce good fruit. Love, peace, patience, kindness. Self control. What? Yeah. Right. When you grow and bear good fruit, you'll be happy and more sparkling. Okay? All right. Would you join me in an echo prayer? That's okay. She can have three. We're into threes today. Okay? Let's do an echo prayer where I say something and we lift it up to God. Okay? Dear God, thank you. For the seeds in our life, deep in our souls, help us to grow deep roots in faith. Especially we pray for the baptism waters 
that nourish us all the days of our life. And may those seeds and the trees we become be air good fruit. In Jesus' name, alleluia and amen. Okay, now all of you gather up your stuff and you're going to follow Nadine up to your class today. And don't forget, you can grow things on this tree. In fact, one of the things that are suggested is you put the names of everyone in your family on the tree and make it a family tree that bears good fruit. Oh, you need the little sheets. All right, who's... Who? You remember? You remember a lot. Oh, good memory. Yeah. Okay. Follow Miss Hannah out the door. Okay. We're coming back to that illustration just so you figured that out. I read today from the 63rd Psalm, verses 1 through 8. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and behold your power and your glory, because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. call to confession. When the time comes to repent, let us not accuse our neighbor, but face the truth within us, and not to belittle or shame, but to seek grace, that we can turn our lives around with God's help. Let us humbly approach God's throne of grace to confess our sins and present ourselves honestly before our Savior. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, you give us chance after chance to do right and bear good fruit. Though you lovingly tend us, we have not put forth the good fruits of your spirit. We continue to stray from your path of righteousness, losing ourselves in the wilderness of sin. Our consumption poisons the earth. Our violence threatens neighbors. Our greed exploits the poor. We must seem a waste of time. But don't give up on us yet, O oh God. Receive us, redeem us, transform us in the disciples you deserve. In your power to abundantly pardon, forgive us for the sake of Christ, and imbue us with love, peace, goodness, and faithfulness. A time of silent confession. Incline your ear and listen, so that you may live. Our God is a loving God, full of mercy. In Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Believe in this forgiveness, be at peace, and share the love you have graciously received. God makes us an everlasting covenant, the sure, steadfast love known to Moses, David, and the ancestors, and revealed in Jesus upon the cross. Trust in the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now let us share the peace of Jesus Christ with one another. Use pretzel arms if you wish. Thank you.
Join with me in prayer before we hear the word of God this morning. Holy God, humble us and open us to your life-giving word. As we hear your word read and proclaimed today, may our hearts and minds be open to the Spirit's moving and Jesus' teaching. In whose name we pray. Amen. We have already heard about how difficult things were for the people of Israel in the time of Jesus. Under Roman rule, under the thumb of the Pharisees and Sadducees, even when it comes to the practice of their faith. And Jesus walks into this in his time in God's time, so that he may provide instruction and demonstrate God's mercy, provision, and presence midst the turmoil and stresses of human life. The incarnate one. Now I would have you listen to the Apostle Paul as he instructs also about what we should learn from the past of our ancestors in faith and how we should stand firmly on the core of our faith traditions. Like in the shadow 
of a mighty rock that is steadfast and immovable in the face of all kinds of difficulties. Listen for a word for your spiritual nurture this day. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our forebearers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples, examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolists, idol-seeking people idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to all. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under its weight. Before I begin the message this morning, I want to thank Siri and Jan for the offering of that song today. For my soul and all of our souls today. In many ways it is proof that God works ahead of us in making provision for what we are experiencing in the course of our life's journey before we begin to experience it. Thanks to the steadfast faith of God for me and for all of us and his promise to be our companion through all things, it is well with my soul today even as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death with my family in this season of Lent. I want to also thank Terry Ott, George Orwell, and Rebecca Solnit, along with the Lord and the Holy Spirit for the inspiration that is guiding this morning's message. I want to also talk a little bit about the blending of this worship service with the story of the fig tree and the seeds and the use of apples today and the seeds that are a part of that. All of you need to know that the reason I know so much about apple trees is because of my mother and my grandfather. My mother grew up on Treesdale Farms up in the north around the Mars area and Pine Richland area it is known now as. She grew up in orchards of apples and peaches and pears and all kinds of things. And through the instruction of my grandfather, I learned the importance of the seed of the fruit and proper pruning of the tree and how it had to go through seasons and phases to bear good fruit. The best fruit from a fruit tree comes in about its seventh year, not even its fourth year, but in its seventh year. Everything before that is probably not fully nourished or full size as it needs to be. But then once it starts to bear good fruit, that tree can last for a decade, two decades, three decades, a lot of years, as long as it is well tended to, 
pruned, fertilized, and absorbs the sun and has deep roots. Think about that in terms of your own life. What is it that makes you capable of bearing good fruit? Good roots in your faith, the waters of baptism, and the water that is living within you side you that Jesus talks about that nourishes us in faith and through all things. In her book, Orwell's Roses, Rebecca Solnit tells the story of George Orwell planting roses in the soil outside a small rented cottage in Wallington, England in 1936. That date is significant because of the phases and seasons of Orwell's life up until that point and beyond. Because as Rebecca recalls in the book, Orwell's life was shot through with wars. Born in British India in 1903, Orwell reached adolescence during the First World War. You remember that one, the war to end all wars? At least that was our hope. And then the Russian Revolution and the Irish War raged into the beginning of Orwell's early adulthood. During the lead up to the Second World War, Orwell joined the Spanish Civil War in 1937 to fight fascism and to defend the principle of democracy. And before his death in 1945, at the age of just 42, he saw the rise of the Cold War and the threat of growing nuclear arsenals. A threat that has reemerged in our day, has it not? In the days we are living now, the threat of nuclear war looms as a potential outsourcing for the purpose of war. As Rebecca speaks about the gardener Orwell in planting those roses near the small cottage, the roses Orwell planted in his English garden were in his mind gifts of posterity. Gifts of posterity. Plants that if they took and rooted well, would outlive the visible effect of any of our other actions, good or evil. Well, Jesus in the parable today highlights another gardener, another gardener's efforts to fulfill the purpose of the gospel. Jesus had just had his followers inform him about the Galileans killed by Pilate and the 18 people who had been killed by the following of the, the falling of the tower in Siloam, a natural tragedy. The people of Israel at that time, at that time, and I think we sometimes frame tragedy and pain and suffering in the same way as punishment by God for their sin or their sins of their ancestors. That's why people suffer. That's why there's pain. That's why there's bad things in the world because people have sinned and this is God's punishment upon us. Notice in this parable, Jesus is quick to say, no, no. That is not the truth. Jesus wanted to make sure people, including us, to this generation, that God is not a controlling dictator of punishment and threat. He is not a tyrant. God does not rule by threat or punishment. God may warn us, God may warn us, of the consequences of our choices 
as individuals or as a community of people, as part of humanity, because of our human choices, which he has gifted us to make. But Jesus wants us to know that God's way is the way of divine mercy. Think about it. In Paul's writings today, he mentions Moses and David, two of the great leaders of the people of Israel. Both of them had murdered someone. But yet they become God's choice to lead his people to salvation. Think about that. What's God's divine way? The way of mercy and grace, not the way of punishment and suffering. Jesus wants us to know that we are given chance after chance to live righteously and bear good fruit. Thus Paul calls Jesus the rock, the spiritual rock from which all people can draw living water for their souls to drink as the people had drank it literally in the wilderness in their journey through the desert. Even acknowledging that some were struck down in the wilderness, not by God, but by their waywardness, away from the rock and God's provision. Paul goes on to cite the examples of our ancestors. In particular, our faith ancestors, the Israelites. We are Judeo-Christian, by the way. Jesus was Jewish. We are Judeo-Christians in this age. Paul cites the examples of our ancestors about the harm that comes as a result of choosing idolatry. And there are all kinds of idols rather than God. Which the Ten Commandments actually warn God's people about. For when we do such things we should not do, murder, steal, covet, take the Lord God's name in vain, put any idol before God, things will not go well necessarily. They're warnings. For when we do such things, we're putting Christ to the test. How are we doing that? Well, he was fully human. So anytime we're behaving fully human in the wrong ways, we're testing what Christ taught us. We continue to live under the rule of idolatry, even in this day. Even having been warned and given a way away from that idolatry. We live under the rule of idolatry when we live self-indulgent lives and self-focused lives which seems to be at the forefront and the core of our cultural context today. In our nation as a people, and the global context of tyranny, violence, and war that we can see and hear about 24-7. We have certainly learned how to emphasize the I in idolatry, the I in indulgent, and the I in the middle of sin, S-I-N. However, as we can see and we can hear and embrace in the humanity of Jesus, the incarnate one, no testing has overtaken us 
that is not uncommon to everyone, including Jesus. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. Where did Jesus find his strength? In the power of the Holy Spirit that was with him and which he gifted to us before his death and his resurrection. The very spirit we proclaim in our baptism until our baptism is complete. God is faithful. Remember, we have the source to endure it. Because Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and the new life. So in looking to the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Jesus the Christ, no matter what shadows we walk through, because we walk in the shadow of the rock, that rock will be with us. Jesus. This is why it's so important for us to plant seeds of faith. Till the soil of our souls, in which the seeds have been planted, nurturing, grow in our faith all the days of our life. Not just when we're young. So we can bear good fruit for the kingdom in the seasons and phases of our life as they are. Not as we might like them to be. And offer seeds of faith to grow in others. Generation unto generation. As heirloom seeds of disciples of Jesus the Christ. Therefore, Jesus tells this parable of the fig tree in response to the information about the death and destruction at this stage of his ministry and mission. Remember, Jesus is preparing his disciples, those who would follow him, for his death. Even by the horrific pathway of crucifixion, he's preparing them. He's preparing them for his death as well as his resurrection. That day is coming for us all because we seek and follow Jesus the Christ. Jesus points to his own life, his own death and resurrection. The three things as seeds of faith by which we can live through the difficulties and shadows of our seasons and phases of life. For the sake of the kingdom of Jesus the Christ. Not for our sake, but for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus the Christ. In this parable, Jesus is not the gardener. Jesus is not the owner. But he's using the parable as an illustration for us. Because in this parable... We could be the fig tree itself, the one who mercifully gets another chance. And we can be the gardener who labors in the field, tends to the soil, and plants seeds that may or may not take root in the souls of others. In his books, Animal Farm and 1984, Orwell challenges the political powers. He challenges the political powers that cause us to question truth and fact, lies and manipulation, and their consequences for the people that they're supposed to serve. Orwell critiqued the authoritarianism that power can produce through threat and coercion and punishment. Orwell planted his roses. And they're still growing today, my friends. You can go and you can smell their fragrance at that small cottage in England. He planted them 
as an expression of beauty in a time when it was difficult to find, but necessary and hoped for all the time. So during this season of Lent, when we're supposed to be tilling the soil of our souls and allowing God's word and God's presence and God's love to re-enter us, that we might live the new life that is coming. In this Lent, when we live in the shadow of the rock, Jesus the Christ, let us consider the gardens of our community of faith, unity, and other congregations. And consider the neighborhood that we've been planted in by God called to tend that neighborhood in his name. How are we laboring in the fields of our souls? We are called to tend. Planting love, faith, and hope. These three. But the greatest of these is love. And all other good gifts of the Spirit, seeds, so that God's kingdom may grow and bloom where you're planted for God's purpose. And praise be to God that by God's mercy we are given chance after chance. Alleluia and amen. My friends, today, post-pandemic, hopefully, we are returning to the practice of receiving offerings, offerings of the resources of our lives. And here to speak about one type of offering you can extend during Holy Week, not the kind you're going to put in the plate today, but another kind you can offer is Tiffany Ennis. Good morning. Well, I'm back again this week because I forgot to mention something last week. Um, I wanted to call attention to the request for crosses in the bulletin that will be part of a display in the transept during Holy Week. You can drop your crosses off in the office anytime up until April 9th. Note cards are provided to write your name and a brief description of your cross. Crosses can be picked up after church on Easter. Please take a moment to dust off and gather your cross or crosses so that we may have an abundant display. And once again, I would like to call your attention to the cloud wall and its symbolism, and at this time extend a prayer of peace, light, and hope to the Molnar family as they walk through this shadow. And if the people and animals of Ukraine and those trying to flee persecution from Russia are heavy on your heart, then maybe take a moment to recognize them on the wall with prayers of peace, light, and hope. Recognize the unity and the goodness in those willing to help, or what I've experienced to be one of our most powerful tools, trust in the Lord. For Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 states, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The instructions how to participate and the circles are located at the entrances. Thank you.
Almighty God, you are the giver of all good gifts. And so transform these gifts and all gifts you have given to us into signs of your presence, signs of your peace, and signs of your possibilities for the kingdom here on earth so that it might be in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. For the offertory today, you saw a, a worldwide violin concert. As an expression of solidarity with the Ukrainian people, the original violinist was from the Ukraine playing in a shelter in Ukraine, joined by violinists all over the world as a sign of that solidarity and in the hope of music soothing the soul. In a moment, we're going to offer a prayer for Ukraine in a different way, and I want you to be praying in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. You're going to view a video of a Ukrainian youth choir singing in their native language, but I think as you watch, you will understand how all of us, soul unto soul, are in solidarity with them. And tears are okay, my friends, because even when we shed tears, we're expressing our solidarity with the people who are living tearful days. Let us watch and pray.
like the English translation is Psalm 31. And I would encourage you to read that psalm as you pray throughout this week. For all the strife, for all the stress, for all the difficulties, for war, and those who are dying. Let us, in solidarity of prayer with one another, pray unto the God of all. Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, you promised to hear us when we pray. To you in his name. Confident in your love and mercy, we offer our prayers on behalf of your world, your people, and all those entrusted to our care. Hear the cries, holy God, of our planet struggling to survive. Give us who consume most of the earth's resources the will to reorder our lives, that the environment might be protected and natural resources be renewed. May all your people have their rightful share of food, medical care, shelter. May all your creatures and all creation know our care and respect. Renew our nation, sovereign God, in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress. Free us from crime and violence. And guard our youth from the perils of selfish individualism and material hoarding. Motivate all citizens to your end of bringing healing among the debilitating divisions that exist. Promote productive and respectful relationships that we all might work towards the good of all your people. Strengthen this congregation, Spirit of God, in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love, that our voices may sing your praises and our lives conform to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and the sacraments of baptism and communion, that we may faithfully minister in your name, and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Sustain those among us, living God, who need your healing. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. And uphold all who suffer in body, mind, emotion, or spirit. In this global moment ravaged by war, Bless those who work for peace and are the helpers. Heal those traumatized by violence. Secure those whose lives and livelihoods are in jeopardy. O oh God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. For in all things we pray. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray in unity the prayer Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
and sisters in Christ, I invite you to continue to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and penance, by prayer and fasting, by works of love, and by reading and meditating on the word of God and engaging in the solidarity of prayer for God's purposes. May the grace, hope, peace, and love of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be with you now and always. Alleluia and amen.